question. Go ahead. Um, for the recitation, do we have to get that approved by you, or can we just no. whatever? No, no, just whatever. All I say in the syllabus is 30 lines. Okay. And I think I, I said, and if I didn't, I'll say it now, or two sonnets. Two sonnets will be 28 lines, close enough. But if you do a speech, a monologue or something like that, 30 lines minimum, okay? If you go a little bit over, that's icing on the cake. Maybe there will be some extra points added on. Um, that's worth 100 points, by the way. Okay, so if you nail that, that's 100 points. If you got, I don't know, 60 on this and you get 100 on that, that just automatically levels those two things out to a B minus. Okay, that's why I said, I mean, you've still got, still got plenty of opportunities to um, raise that, or raise the grade. Okay, so if you could figure out, or if you could determine with 100% accuracy and had proof who WH is, um, one, you'd be famous. I'm not kidding. You'd be on CNN. You'd be on MSNBC. You'd be on Fox. Even though this is a st stupid, nerdy little, you know, kind of a thing. And you could probably, man, you could write your ticket, essentially, in terms of an English professorship. Because this has been the number one question related to the science. Who is WH? Okay. This is the what's called the epistle dedicatory, or the dedicatory epistle to Shakespeare's sonnets. Shakespeare's sonnets were published in 1609. Right? While he was obviously still alive, and we don't know if Shakespeare had anything to do with the publishing of those sonnets. That is, we don't know if um, Thomas Thorpe, the guy who published them, we don't know if he had Shakespeare's blessing to do that. Or if he got a just a copy of Shakespeare's sonnets and published them on his own. Okay. Whatever the case, he prefaces to the sonnets this little letter, epistle. To the only begetter of these ensuing sonnets, Mr. W.H., all happiness and that eternity promised by our ever-living poet, wisheth the well-wishing adventurer in setting forth. T.T. T.T. is Thomas Thorpe. W.H., we don't know. Our ever-living poet implies the poet is still alive. Okay. It could also mean our poet will never die. <coughs> he, will, he will live eternally. Okay. So, there's a bunch of questions. If you read your introduction to the sonnets, which I hope you did, it kind of takes this apart. So, to the only begetter of these ensuing sonnets, what does begetter mean? You know, it's one of those words that's used an awful lot in the Bible. And so-and-so begat, and so-and-so begat, and so-and-so. That means father of. Okay? So, is the begetter the father of these ensuing sonnets? Because some think that the WH is actually a typo. And it should be W.S. And the begetter would be Shakespeare. Okay. Which would be kind of odd because of what happens beneath that. All happiness and that eternity promised by our ever-living poet. So why would our ever-living poet, if it's Shakespeare, be wishing happiness and promise eternity to himself? <laughs> Doesn't make a lot of sense. Okay. So... Begetter can have two meanings. It can mean the author of the sonnets, or it can mean the person who procured these sonnets for me. The person who brought them to my shop. Okay. And the implication is, that's who WH is. Okay. Now, Your introduction talks about the possibilities of WH. There are several, but there's really only two biggies. 
if you want, or two major contenders. If WH is actually what it's supposed to be there, and if it actually really means anything in connection with Shakespeare. Okay. One, Henry Riosley, your introduction mentions his name. W-R-I-O. I never remember if there's an E before the S. Henry Riosley, okay, who is the third Earl of Southampton. So who is Henry Riosley, the third Earl of Southampton? He's the person Shakespeare dedicated Venus and Adonis in The Rape of Lucrece to. Two poems he'd already written, early 1590s. Okay. He was a patron of Shakespeare's. Moreover, he kind of fits the description of the young man that is referred to in the first 125, 126 sonnets. The, the so-called golden-haired youth. Okay. We actually have, I should put it on our D12 page. We actually have a, um, there's a miniature um, painting of Riosley, and he's got long, curly, golden hair. Okay. The other one is William Herbert. Well, notice it's W.H. Henry Riosley's H.W. Okay, that could just be reversed. The other one is William Herbert, 3rd Earl of Pembroke. Well, who is he? He's the one that Shakespeare's colleagues in the acting company, both Lord Chamberlain's men and King's men, um, John Hemings and Henry Condell, dedicated the first folio to. Those are the two kind of major candidates. And then there are some others. William Hart, who is Shakespeare's brother-in-law. And then there's another William Hart, who is Shakespeare's nephew. That's about all I know about those two. Okay? And then there's another guy named William Hughes. These are all people that have been suggested. Okay? But Riosley and William Herbert, again, those are the two major candidates. Those are people with whom either Shakespeare had a direct connection, okay, or a close indirect connection in terms of, you know, Herbert with the um, first folio. Okay? So, solve that conundrum. Solve that puzzle. Get your graduate degree, become a, you know, get your PhD, solve that, and have a chair of English at Harvard or, or, you know, Yale or Princeton or Cambridge or Oxford, if you want, or King's College in London or, you know, pretty much name it. I mean, if you can conclusively solve that, you'd write your own ticket, okay? Another issue with the sonnet. Now keep in mind, Shakespeare's not writing sonnets in a vacuum. If you read the introduction, the introduction talks about major sonnet sequences beginning in the late 1580s and going through the early to mid-1590s. Who, who wrote the first sonnet, by the way? Not in English. Italian. Francis Petrarch. Okay? Petrarch wrote sonnets, and all sonnet means is a little love song. Petrarch wrote sonnets, or a little song, if you want, um, to and about a young woman named Laura. I almost, train of thought, almost completely derailed. Laura, who he loved from a distance. Okay? And it's from Petrarch that we get all kinds of what are called Petrarchan conventions. That is, these images and tropes that are used throughout sonnets. Okay. Such as, you know, the lover's eyes overflowing with tears and causing floods that destroy towns and fields. Okay. The lover's sighs causing hurricanes and winds and tempests. Okay. Things like that. Similarly, the beloved's smile being like the sun shining from behind the clouds, etc. So Petrarch creates all these images that later sonneteers essentially just copy. 
By the time this gets published in 1609, the whole sonnet sequence kind of um, fad has run its course. By 1609, you don't have people writing quote-unquote major sonnet sequences. Those begin, as I said, late 1580s and go through the mid-1590s. You have um, Sir Philip Sidney's Stella and Astrophil and Stella. I think, by the way, the Stella there is where um, Tennessee Williams comes up with his Stella in Midsummer. Not Midsummer. Streetcar Named Bizarre. Right? Um, you have uh, Edmund Spencer's Amoretti, okay, which is a fairly long sequence of sonnets directed to his fiance, future wife, a um, whole bunch of others, right, in the 1590s. You have individual sonnets begun being written in English in the 1550s, 1560s, right? So by the time, as I said, this gets published, it's, it's old and stale. Well, one of the things Shakespeare does in the sonnets, and we think he probably wrote most of these in the 1590s, possibly when the theaters were closed because of plague. Um, we know many of them were written by 1598 because Francis Mears refers to them in his Palatistamia. He talks about Shakespeare's sugared sonnets. Right? Uh, that's in the introduction, by the way. What Shakespeare does with some of them is he takes these Petrarchan conventions and he turns them on their head. In other words, he's taking the accepted style and modifies it. Why? Possibly to rejuvenate the sonnet sequence traditions. Now, in these other sonnet sequences, the, in, in, let me go this way. In Petrarch's sonnet sequence, you have a story being told. From beginning to end. In the Elizabethan sonnet sequences, you kind of have a story being told. You definitely do in Sidney's Astrophil and Stella. You more or less do in Spencer's Amoretti. It's not clear whether you do or not in Shakespeare's. Or at least that's what your introduction tells you. Right? I think the sequence does generally give you the outline of a story. What's the story? What's the outline? You have two friends at the beginning of the sonnets. One of those friends is an aristocrat. The other one is not. <laughs> is most definitely not. The other one is middle class, we would say. Okay? And so there is, you know, to use modern language, there's a power imbalance between those two. So the one who is not an aristocrat uses kind of aristocratic language in talking to the other one and says, you know, I, I kind of bask in your glory, blah, 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 blah. All right? And so what we have between those two is a friendship. All right? If you want to think of it as a Platonic friendship, that's fine. So what is, what's a platonic friendship? Anybody? Non-romantic. Non-erotic. Non okay? And I'm going to point to a sonnet that I think at least, and Bevington makes the same comment, though he kind of then undercuts it, I think makes it pretty clear. This is not an erotic relationship, or homoerotic relationship, if you want, between the male speaker of the sonnets, okay, and the golden-haired youth, recipient, it, at least in the first 126, okay, that's the recipient. So you have this friendship between these two, platonic, a meeting of the minds, so to speak, okay. But the speaker of the sonnets, there are also two or three other individuals. So you have, 
I can get rid of this now. Um, yes, shut down. So you have one, the speaker. Two, we would call the G H Y. We'll pronounce that guy. The I have the guy. Okay, the golden haired youth. Three, beginning with sonnet 127, that's where this individual is directly addressed. You have the so-called dark lady. And then four, in a few, not many. There's a rival poet. Right? So this is the speaker. He's the one kind of determining everything. And then there are these three other reference, R-E-F-E-R-E-N-T-S, within the body of the sonnet sequence. Okay? Most of 1 through 126 are to the golden-haired youth. 127 through 52, most of are to the Dark Lady. 153 and 154, eh, they don't seem to be really directed to anybody. And in the rival poet, there's three or four within these that is addressed to, or not necessarily addressed to, but referred to. And some think that the rival poet is Christopher Marlowe. There's a problem with that, however. Well, let me rephrase that. There's a problem with the rival poet being Christopher Marlowe if we read the poems biographically. That is, if we understand the speaker to be William Shakespeare, then there's a problem with having the rival poet be Christopher Marlowe for the simple reason that Christopher Marlowe died when? If these are written in the mid-1590s, 1593. If these are written in the mid-1590s, and they're biographical, and they are recounting an actual relationship of sorts, he'd be dead. He wouldn't be a rival poet anymore. Okay. There is a line in one of the sonnets about a great reckoning in a little room. We take that to be a reference to Christopher Marlowe's death. It was a great reckoning. Why? He was sent to his maker in a little, it was a bar tab fight. At least that's the commonly understood cause for Marlowe's death. Other, others want to uh, go a bit more conspiratorial and say Christopher Marlowe had to be murdered by the government because of some dirt that he knew about the queen. Chris, if you don't know, let me back up a little bit. Christopher Marlowe, famous poet, 1580s, early 1590s, worked as a spy for Queen Elizabeth. Okay. Um, his part of his payment for that working as a spy was she had Cambridge University grant him a Master of Arts degree. Okay. He could not get a Master of Arts degree from Cambridge University for two reasons. One, he was homosexual openly. Two, he was an atheist. In order to attend Cambridge or Oxford at the time, you had to, quote-unquote, be a believer. He was openly an atheist. And she just kind of, you know, swept that under the rug and had this um, done. But there are some folks who say he was killed by an assassin to keep some Hidden things from ever being made known. You can do that what you want. Okay, so let's look at Sonnet 1. Now, the first couple of dozen sonnets are all about more or less. Now, let me back up here. Let's talk about some themes of the sonnet. So, how many of you read all those sonnets that I had assigned for today? 
A few of you did. What are some of the themes that show up in those sonnets? Louder? Beauty. What about it? So, reproduce it, right? From fairest creatures we desire increase. Okay, it's the first line of the first sonnet. True or false? Come on, be honest. True. Some of you don't want to be honest, I can tell, you know, political correctness or whatever. We don't want ugly people to have children. We don't. Similarly, you don't breed flowers to produce ugly flowers. You don't breed cattle to produce ugly cattle. You don't breed horses to produce ugly horses. No, you breed them to produce what? The finest examples of their specimen, etc. We want the same thing from, uh, if you're gonna be brutally honest, from us, okay? That is us meaning humanity. So, if you're beautiful, Reproduce. Okay, what else? Louder? Nature. What about it? Uh, mentions, of, mentions of seasons. And okay. Natural seasons, etc. It's not necessarily a theme, though. That's an image. Unless you make, unless there is a statement made about nature and the seasons, take that another step or two. Because you're on the right track, Thomas. Time does what? Keeps going around, and as it keeps going around, what happens? You guys are all in your early 20s or so. I'm in my mid-50s. Another 30, 40 years, you'll be in your mid-30s, 40s, 50s. Not 30s. 40s, 50s, 30 years, mid-50s, and I'll be dead. Time devours all. Well, what does the all include? Unless you're a Hollywood actor, actress, you know, and you can spend a billion dollars on plastic and just keep adding it to your face and such. What else? Okay. I mean, we could go on. Opinion? Others' opinions? Of... You, your opinions of others. So let's start with number one. From fairest creatures we desire increase, that thereby beauty's rose might never die. But as the riper should by time decease, his tender air might bear his memory. Let's make it rhyme like it would have in Shakespeare's day. Okay? But thou, contracted to thine own bright eyes, feeds thy light's flame with self-substantial fuel. <clears throat> Making a famine where abundance lies, thyself thy foe to thy sweet self too cruel. Thou that art now the world's fresh ornament and only herald to the gaudy spring. Notice I didn't pause after ornament. It reads right on. Right? Within thine own bud buriest thy content, and tender churl makes waste in niggardine. Pity the world, or else this glutton be. To eat the world's due by the grave and thee. So, look at that first quatrain. From fairest creatures we desire increase, that thereby beauty's rose might never die, but as the riper should by time decease, his tender air, excuse me, might bear his memory. What does that mean? But as the riper should by time decease. Yeah. The riper, the riper you get, time does what to you? D ceases you. Okay? So, we want things to increase that are beautiful. Why? So that when the beautiful person is dead, what? His tender air might bear his memory. It doesn't mean, might remember dear old dad. 
It means we might look on that person's air and say, spit an image. Okay? We might see the deceased person in his children. <coughs> but thou. Why the but? What's the but imply? What does but always imply? Oh, I really love da 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 da. But. Contradiction. There's a turn there. Okay? But thou, contracted to thine own bright eyes. Contracted. What's that mean? Nikki? Brought in on it. Exactly. Reduced to. You, whole person, whole body, reduced to just your notice. Bright eyes. Clear. Not clouded over with cataracts, not wrinkled. Reduced to thine own bright eyes, feeds thy light's flame, excuse me, thy light's flame with self-substantial fuel. Self-substantial, burning on itself. Making a famine where abundance lies. Thyself, <laughs> thy foe, to thy sweet self too cruel. What's the implication? What is the person being addressed not doing with his own bright eyes? He's not trying to reproduce naturally. So how do you reproduce with your eyes? Well, the Middle Ages thought, you know, in somewhat in Shakespeare's day, thought the way the reason we see is our light, our eyes shoot out beams of light, essentially. Okay? This is why, you know, the gaze could be so dangerous. You don't want to look somebody too closely in the eyes because then your eye beams have sex. Essentially. Okay? John Dunn, take my 3010 course, we'll read some Dunn, where Dunn talks about propagating in the eyes. Because what happens when you look somebody closely in the eyes? What do you see in their eyes? Yourself. What are you doing? Creating yourself in that person's eyes. Where's this beloved, let's say, creating himself? I think Shakespeare's getting at this kind of image. Wow. He's looking in a mirror. This is like Narcissus. That's why he is the foe to others. Okay? With I, excuse me, to himself. Because he's not reproducing that anywhere else. Thou that art now the world's fresh ornament. What does that mean, the world's fresh ornament? Put it in modern terms. The latest big hit thing. The latest biggest star, so to speak. That is, people look at you, man. You are the model of fashion. And only herald to the gaudy spring. Herald, forerunner, announcement, spring notices described how? Gaudy. What does gaudy mean? Okay, it can mean tacky. It's overdone. That is too, too much beauty, right? I mean, look at springtime around here. You got red buds, you've got daffodils, you've got dogwoods, everything. It's just, you know, like... Chill out, man. It's too much. Just give us a little color. That's what he's getting at. Within thine own bud buriest thy content. Is it content or content? What's the difference in the pronunciation? What does the different pronunciation mean? Content, stress first syllable, or content, stress on second syllable. One is the stuff, the content. And the other is what? Your happiness or attitude. So what do you do? Within thine own bud, you bury your joy, your happiness, or your stuff. And yeah, there could be a possible sexual pun there on the word bud. Okay? Could mean penis. And tender churl makes waste in niggardine. 
What's niggardine mean? If somebody is niggardly with their money, what are they? Miserly. It's exactly it. Miserly. So, this tender churl is what? Miserly in his content. He's not giving out of himself. He is not, to use the phrase, sowing his wild oats. All right? So, as with all of Shakespeare's sonnets, we then get a conclusion. Because the way the sonnets work is premise, 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 conclusion. Right? They're like a syllogism. Pity the world. Show pity on the world. Or else this glutton be. And you don't really want to be called a glutton. Why? Because it's one of the seven deadly sins. Or this glutton be to eat the world's due. How do you eat the world's due? Okay, first of all, what is the world's due? Whose? Okay. What's the due part, though? I mean, you're right, Nikki. I just want you to take it one, one more step. Close. It's what you owe the world. His beauty is what he owes the world. So, pity the world or be a glutton. To eat the world's due, that is, to keep within yourself what you owe to the world by the grave and be. That's how he would eat it, by not sharing it. Okay. So what's the speaker saying to this individual? Do we know anything about the gender of the individual yet? We've had a bunch of his pronouns, but they're not necessarily addressed to Thou, okay? Whoever the recipient is, that recipient is being told to do what? <clears throat> Get laid? It's a little more than that, however. Have kids. So it could be get laid, have fun, but <laughs> have children, okay? And then that is immediately followed by the next one. When forty winters shall besiege thy brow and dig deep trenches in thy beauty's field, thy youth's proud livery, so gazed on now, will be a tottered weed of small worth healed. <laughs> in Shakespeare's day, the field would be more like fed and held. Right? Will be a tottered weed of small worth held. Then being asked where all thy beauty lies, where all the treasure of thy lusty dies, to say within thine own deep sunken eyes, where on all eating shame and thriftless prize, how much more prize deserve thy beauty's use, if thou couldst answer, this fair child of mine shall sum my count and make my old excuse, proving his beauty by succession thine, and this were to be new made when thou art old, and see thy blood warm when thou feel'st it cold. By the way, in case you're curious, I'm reading mine from this edition. This is one of the best editions of Shakespeare's sonnets for the simple reason that here are the sonnets. Here is the commentary to those sonnets. Okay? Um, it's, it's fantastic. If I ever do get to teach the uh, Shakespeare sonnet course, this is what I will use. So, when 40 winters, what has the speaker kind of metaphorically done from Sonnet 1 to Sonnet 2? Aged at 40 years. Yeah, imagine now you're proverbially an old man. What's going to happen to you? Your face will have time, will dig deep trenches in thy beauty's field. Thy youth's proud livery, what does livery there mean? Clothing, that is, what other people see of you, okay? They use proud livery, so gazed on now. People look at this guy and go, wow. Will be a tottered weed of small worth held. 
Look at Mel Gibson today and Mel Gibson 30 years ago. Look at Gerard Butler today and look at Gerard Butler drinking five years ago. My wife would say, yeah, but look at Sean Connery today and look at Sean Connery at any time because he just gets better with age. But that kind of <laughs> takes Shakespeare out of the way. So gaze on now will be what? A tottered weed. Why? Because Shakespeare's playing on that notion of clothing as weeds. We will hear in Tempest, assuming we do the Tempest, somebody talks about their clothing as the weeds I'm wearing. doesn't mean they're going out picking goldenrod and stuff and weaving clothes out of it. Okay? It's just another, it's an old word for clothing. But he says it will be what? Tottered. Think of that as tattered. So, when you're 40, the beauty you have now, not so much. Then, when you are 40, if someone comes up and says, man, what happened to you? You used to be so handsome. Where are all the treasure of thy lusty days? Lusty does have the modern meaning, lusty, but it also <coughs> means simply pleasure-filled <coughs> days. Your youth. What can you do? To say within thine own deep sunken eyes were an all eating shame and thriftless praise. How many of you ever saw the film Hook? Robin Williams, um, Little Short, Dustin Hoffman, and a bunch of other characters. You remember the scene in Hook? Yeah. When Robin Williams' character, which is something like Peter Banning, goes back to Neverland, and the one little kid goes up to him, they're trying to make him remember that he's Peter Pan. And the one little kid goes up to him and does this and pushes his face back, and he goes, There you are, Peter. What does he mean? You can see the youth and the wrinkles. Because the wrinkles are gone. There you are, Peter. I knew you were there. To say, well, look in my eyes, I'm still pretty. No, that would be an all-eating shame and thriftless praise. How much more praise deserved thy beauty's use? If you're beautiful, what? Use it. If thou couldst answer, this fair child of mine shall sum my count and make my old excuse. You want to see where all my beauty is? How's this? How's this one look? This, this is what I spin it all on. That is, I gave all my beauty right here. Proving his beauty by succession thine. Have you ever known somebody, maybe you are one of these people, that looks like the spitting image, maybe not necessarily of a parent, but of a grandparent, we've got a friend. She's a few years younger than I, about 10 years younger than I am. She's got a picture of her, I think her great-grandmother on the wall. And Nikki is the absolute spitting image. You would think this person on this picture came and was alive today. Just exactly the same. Okay? That's what he's getting at. This, this, to be able to point to that child. This were to be new made when thou art old. And see thy blood warm when thou feelst it cold. Why, when you feel your blood cold? What in the world is Shakespeare talking about? Because I'm 57. My blood doesn't feel any colder than it did when I was 27. Play on this Renaissance notion that as you age, your blood gets thicker. And it does also cool. Okay, so think of blood as bacon grease. Sorry, me vegans. Think of bacon grease right when you pull the bacon out of the pan. That grease is really fluid, right? But let's sit there a couple hours, and what happens? It thickens. <laughs> it thickens. Yeah, that's my blood. Your blood is like that sloshy grease, right? As you feel your blood grow cold, you can look at your kid and go, ah, that makes me feel alive. Okay? 
go from there to I, if I had my druthers, we'd just keep we'd do every one of these things. But we can't. Go from there to Sonnet 18. Okay. Which is one of the great love poems of the English language. It's included in every, you know, the 100 world's best love poems. Problem is, it's not a love poem. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough, what, rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's list hath all too short a debt. Kind of how it would have been pronounced in Shakespeare's day. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed. And every fair from fair sometime declines, by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade. Notice at the end of line 8, or at the beginning of line 9, you get a change. Okay? This is called okay, the volta. It's the turn. Why? Because Petrarch, in his sonnets, always introduced at the end of line 8, or at the very beginning of line 9, a change, a contrast. Shakespeare follows that even though that's not necessary in an English sonnet of which Shakespeare is writing, right? So, but thy eternal summer shall not fade nor lose possession of that fear thou owest, nor shall death brag thou wanderst in his shade when in eternal limes to time thou growest. So let's stop there. We'll take up the couplet in a, mo in a moment. First quatrain, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? It's a good question. What do we think of a summer's day? Is a summer's day beautiful? Can be, right? Doesn't it depend upon the day? I mean, if it's August 15th in Murfreesboro, not so much as if it's August 15th in London usually, because it can be too hot, right? So he goes in the next couple lines, and qualifies that summer's day. Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Temperate means what? Not too hot. Not too hot. Goldilocks? Not too cold. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May. May showers. Okay. So you have this idea of Storms coming, and what can they do to those beautiful little buds on flowers? Knock them off. Kill them in their infancy. And summer's lease hath all too short a date. Now, this is written during what's called the Little Ice Age. That was a period of cooling in the Northern Hemisphere. It wasn't global, but it was Northern Hemisphere. Summers did not seem to last as long as they normally would. And even today, a lot of the summers that I've been over in, in England, you know, the Brits are complaining left and right because they're not having enough warm days. And then they get warm days and they get angry because it's too warm. Because they don't have air conditioning over there. They don't know the physics behind it, I guess. It's like they also lost the recipe for ice. If you want ice, you have to go to an American-owned establishment, you know, Pizza Hut, McDonald's, something like that. So, rough winds do shake the darling buds of May and summer's lease have all too short a date. That is, it ends too quickly. So, May, stormy, August, September, starting to cool off already. So, do I really want to compare you to a summer's day? Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines. You don't want to be in England when it's in the 90s. I've been there um, two of the three hottest days in the last century. One of those times, who even knows, 2003, the day we left, it hit 101 in London. That is just utterly unbearable. It's bad enough here, but it's unbearable there. 
Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines. Keep in mind, he still shall I. The, the speaker is kind of mentally going through. I don't know, because sometimes it's really hot. And often it's his gold complexion dimmed. And there are plenty of times in London when it is only 60 degrees in the middle of July or August. And every fair from fair sometime declines. Every fair. Every there means all. Fair, beautiful thing, from beautiful thing. Skip the sometime. Declines. Well, what does that mean? How does fair from fair decline? This is a platonic idea. Plato. Because Plato taught what? There are essentially two worlds, right? How many of you have taken a course in either classical mythology or the European Lit to 1400 course? If you haven't taken the European Lit to 1400 course, take it next fall. should be offered to you. Plato taught there is the world of forms or ideas. And then there is this world. What C.S. Lewis referred to as the shadow lands. Why? Because we down here are mere shadows or copies of what is real up here. It's what the whole allegory of the cave by Plato is entirely about. Okay? Well, we can see this idea borne out, for example, in the copying of texts. My dissertation was a critical edition of John Donne's Holy Sonnets. It was within the, the field of what's called textual criticism. Right? I could give, I could write out a text, write out with my hand, okay? and give that to everyone in this room. And I would put a thousand, if I had it, I would put a thousand dollars on this table and say, $1,000 says that not all 17 or so copies of that text will be exactly like the text I gave you. Why? Because every time you copy something, you, in, you introduce little errors. Even if that copy is like this, a printed copy. Because if we were working from either the first folio or this book, okay, what would we see? And you've all seen this in books. You've been reading on along and you notice, oh, there's a little error there, okay? In this day of printing, sometimes the comma doesn't show up because the comma didn't get inked when the platen was run over, right? So it's kind of that idea. Sometimes fair from fair declines. That is, what is beautiful doesn't produce an exact copy. Why or how does that not occur? By chance or changing or nature's changing course untrimmed. Chance or nature untrims the beauty from beauty. How do you untrim something? Take the un off and just use the verb trim. We're coming up on a holiday not this month, next month, where people will have something and it'll be called, you know, such and such with all the trimmings. What's all the trimmings referred to in terms of a Thanksgiving dinner? It's not the turkey, right? It's everything that goes with it. And then there'll be another holiday in the following month and people will put up dead trees in their homes or plastic ones and they will do what to those trees? Decorate. You decorate it. That's called trimming the tree. Trimming the tree doesn't mean going out there with little hand shears and cutting the edges off to make sure it's a nice, perfect pyramid. No. Trimming is decorating, adorning, ornamenting. So untrimming, undecorating, unadorning, unornamenting. And notice that happens how? By chance 
or nature's changing course. What's nature's changing course? Time. That's all it is. But. What's the but imply? Not you. Not you, person being addressed. Thy eternal summer shall not fade. Your summer shall be perpetual. Nor lose possession of that fair thou owest. What's that fair? The beauty. You won't lose possession of the beauty that you have. Keats did the same thing, right? Ode on a Grecian urn. What do you see in that poem? The, the, the youth who is chasing the maiden is always, we're told in that ode, so close. He will always be so close, and she will always be so far away. Okay? Nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade. So is the beloved not going to die? When in, in eternal lines to time thou growest. In other words, physically, yeah, you're going to die. <laughs> Everybody dies. But you will live. You will have an eternal summer day. What? When in eternal lines to time thou growest. Now, notice the pun there. What's the pun? You remember, Shakespeare never met a pun he didn't use or didn't like. What happens when you grow old? Generally, what happens to your face? You get wrinkles. You get lines. When in eternal lines, you ever seen any of those pictures of, you know, the longest living person just died and they just looked like a shih tzu? I mean, just blew <laughs> Not a Shih Tzu. The other one. No. Uh, Chinese dog. Chow. No, not Chow. No, not that one. Oh, it's, it's the one with literally just fold upon fold upon fold. Sharpe, thank you. Yeah, Sharpe. So it's the human Sharpe, okay? But what are the lines? They're these lines. Now look at the conclusion. So long as men can breathe, their eyes can see. No pauses. And notice almost sing-song rhyme to that. So long as men can breathe, their eyes can see. So long does this and this give life to thee. So long lives this. This what? This poem. And this does what? We're still reading about this guy. We don't know who it is. <laughs> Not named. And theoretically, Shakespeare poet could have no one in mind for this. This can be a generic, if you want, hymn to beauty. H-Y-M-N. -M, ode to beauty, if you want. Okay? Rather than about a specific person. Because all too often, because of that epistle dedicatory, we get hung up on, well, who is the golden-haired youth? Rather than Maybe it's just, you know what? If you're good looking, go have kids. The flip side of that, obviously, sorry if you're not good looking, is don't. Okay? Um, look at 19. Okay, so what's the theme of 18 and 19? 18's obviously have children, but what else is it? You can live how? You can live immortally where? Poetry. Okay. 19. Devouring time. Notice, that's being addressed. Time. Blunt thou the lion's paws and make the earth devour her own sweet brood. Pluck the keen teeth from the fierce tiger's jaws and burn the long lived phoenix in her blood. Make glad and sorry season as thou fleetst and do whatever thou wilt, swift footed time. To the wide world and all her fading sweets. So, time, do what? Wreak havoc on the world. I don't care. Destroy all that stuff. But, 
I forbid thee one most heinous crime, O carve not with thy hours my love's fair brow. Don't touch, let's assume golden-haired youth, him, nor draw no lines there with thine, is it antique? Well, look at your little accent. Or antic. Antique, pronounced that way, has a specific meaning. Antic can have both the old meaning of antique, but it can also have what meaning? If someone is antic, Hamlet will say to Horatio, if I put on an antic disposition, don't give out that you know what I'm doing. Crazed, frantic, haphazard. Nor draw no lines there with thine antic pen, like Stevie Wonder with a marker. You know, don't do this. Him in thy course untainted do allow. Untainted. Shakespeare loves, I mean, ideas are repeated throughout the poems and the plays. And there's the idea of tainted and untainted. Hamlet. The ghost tells Hamlet, taint not thy mind. When he tells him, revenge my death. And Hamlet's like, I'll wipe everything away I've ever learned so that I have one thing on my mind. Kill Claudius. He doesn't just taint his mind. He fully dies it, you know. So, him in thy course untainted. Don't touch him. Why? For beauty's pattern to succeeding men. Let him be as he is now, so that he will be the model for later ages. Yet, Ah, we have another change. Yet implies what? Never mind. Do thy worst. Go ahead, have at him. Old time. Why does the speaker call time old? It's essentially pejorative. You dirty, rotten SOB, time. Do your worst. This is a challenge, right? It's a dare. Despite thy wrong, thy wrong, my love shall live in my verse. My love shall in my verse ever live young. Go ahead. Take your best shot. Why? Because as long as men live and have eyes to see, and they're reading this, he'll always be. You can't touch him with this. So up until this point, we've had a bunch of sonnets that are essentially telling a man to go have children. And they're also talking about love, my love. It's not my affection for you, but you are my love. Okay? And then we get sonnet 20. Now, a lot of people, especially in the last 20 years, Want to read the sonnets as a sequence kind of describing a homoerotic affair. Whether that homoerotic affair is actually consummated or it's just homoerotic desire. Seems to me, and quite a few others, Sonnet 20 puts the kibosh on that. It just kind of kills it dead in its tracks. A woman's face with nature's own hand painted. That is, nature made a woman's face. Hast thou. Who's the thou? That's the recipient of the previous 19 sonnets. That's the him that's been referred to. Hast thou, the master mistress of my passion. Why master mistress? Well, mistress implies the object of the passion of a male, but master implies lordship. Okay. Well, what else hast thou? A woman's gentle heart. 
but not acquainted with shifting change as is false women's fashion. And I, more bright than theirs, less fall and rolling, gilding the object whereupon it gazes. A man in hue, all hues in his controlling, which steals men's eyes and women's souls amazes. And for a woman wert thou first created, notice no volta, till nature is she wrought thee fellow doting, and by addition me of thee defeated, by adding one thing to my purpose nothing. But since she pricked thee out for, nature, for women's pleasure, mine be thy love and thy love's use their treasure. So, go back to line three. A woman's gentle heart, but not acquainted with shifting change, as is false women's fashion. False women's fashion. How do you read that clause? Is that saying all women are false? Or only women who are false have shifting change? Because some people have read it that the speaker is saying, all women are false. You can't trust a woman. Therefore, trust a man, you know. And I more bright than theirs, less false in rolling. What is a rolling eye? We wouldn't use rolling, but we would use a word that begins with R, maybe. Roving. That is, women's eyes don't just look on a single beloved, but one there, and there, and there, and there, and there. Like the old Stephen Bishop, Elvin Bishop song. If you can't love the one you want, love the one you're with. Okay? And I'm more bright than theirs, less false and rolling. And what do their false eyes do? Gilding the object whereupon it gazeth. There's that medieval notion that I talked about of the eyes shooting out light. Because what does it mean to gild something? You cover it in gold. And so the eye looks at something and covers it in gold. That's why jump up to the 19th century, beauty is where? In the eye of the beholder. Because the eye of the beholder is what makes that thing beautiful. A man in hue, all hues in his controlling. In hue means in visage. In how this person appears. And notice, this person's appearance does what to all other people's appearances? It controls them. Okay, I'm going to ask the ladies. Ladies, name a man who could walk into this room whose hue, hue's visage, would control all of our visages. That is, yours as well as the two men that are in here. Pick one. Name one. Anybody? Chris Pratt. Chris Pratt, okay. Probably. I mean, I'd be amazed if Chris Pratt were to walk in this room, and it wouldn't just be because it's Chris Pratt, because I'd be like, it's just not fair. <laughs> <laughs> in the past, I've used, you know, Brad Pitt, because most women go kind of, you know, just turn to butter, and some guys, you know. Mel Gibson, like I said 20 years ago. Um, four. Chris Hemsworth. Chris Hemsworth. Not fair. Okay. <laughs> Chris Evans, the three Chris's. Literally, Bring in the three Pine. amigos. The fourth one, Chris Pine. Chris Pine, you know. Yeah, but he's getting a little old. I mean, he's getting a little wrinkly. He fits. <laughs> yeah, but he's still the drink. So, what's he saying here? This is the kind of individual. It's not saying, you know, the perfect androgyne that, you know, walks in and you're gone. Not sure. No. This is the person who walks in and everybody goes, wow. And it's not because of fame. It's not because of anything like that. Which steals men's eyes, notice, and women's souls amazing. Steals men's eyes, and I think that's the, it's not fair, and the women are going, mine. 
<laughs> and for a woman wert thou first created. The most important line, word in that line is for. Because what's it mean? Till nature as she wrought thee fell a doting. What does it mean to dote on something? Love it, cherish it, and do what? Pamper it? To what extent? If you're neglecting other things. Neglecting other things, kind of losing one's attention, one's focus. I mean, you're just going crazy over this thing. So nature, while creating this person for a woman, the for there, as. Nature's creating, you know, got it on the operating table, Dr. Frankenstein kind of thing, creating this to be a woman. She fell a doting. She forgot. And by addition, me of the defeated. That is, she added something to you that defeated me. By adding one thing to my purpose, nothing. What's his purpose? Speaker is male. If you were created to be a woman, and I'm a male, we're talking, you know, straight relationship. What is your purpose for slash to me? Sex, right? That's what he's getting at. But she fell a doting on you and added something to you that then makes what of my purpose? Nothing. But what else is his purpose? His purpose is the, where is it? His purpose in her is nothing. That is, where she should have a nothing, think binary. Now there's something. But since she, and then Shakespeare wants to make clear, his audience understands, prick thee out for women's pleasure. Yes, the word prick the slang prick had the same meaning in Shakespeare's day. For women's pleasure, what? Mine be thy love. Love, notice here, is not what? It's not erotic. It's not sexual. It's where? Go to Sonnet 116. Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. It's not here. Or in here. Okay? Mine be thy love and thy love's use. Because how do you, quote unquote, male-female relationship show love? Is it going out for dinner, buying cards? Blah, 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 blah. No, it's sex. Okay? Put bluntly. I can't have sex with you. Why? Because I'm a straight male and you're a straight male. But we can have this kind of love, platonic, friendship love, okay? Um, uh, 29, I don't know that we can do this in three minutes. Or two minutes, we'll try. When in disgrace with fortune in men's eyes, I all alone beweep my outcast state, and trouble deaf heaven with my bootless cries. Bootless. I'm not getting any response, God. I've been asking you for something. You're not hearing me. And look upon myself and curse my fate. That is, when my life sucks. That's the quatrain one. Wishing me like to one more rich in hope. I wish I was like this person because that person has more hope in me. Featured like him, Chris Hemsworth. Like him with friends possessed. He's got 800 friends on Facebook. I've got two. Desiring this man's art, this person's poetic ability, and that man's scope, this person's breadth of writing ability, with what I most enjoy contented least. Yet in these thoughts myself almost despising, happily I think on thee. That is, when I'm just having the world's greatest pity party and think my life is horrible, happily. Happily doesn't mean happily. It means by chance, by happenstance. I think on thee and then my state, like to the lark at break of day arising, 
from sullen earth sings hymns at heaven's gate. Why? For thy sweet love remembered such wealth brings. What's the wealth? Thy sweet love remembered. Your love of me that then I scorn to change my state with kings. In other words, I'd rather be a down on my left nobody remembering your love for me than to change my state with kings. Okay, we'll stop there. We will pick up with number 30 on Tuesday. So make sure you do 55, 71, 73, 87, 93, 97, and 98 specifically, but read all the others as well.